Eric, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So let's take a look rather briefly at this career that you've had in security. Now, it feels wrong sometimes to just abbreviate people's decades of experience in security in just a couple of minutes, but you had this whole array of different cybersecurity positions, which frankly, for guests on this show is pretty rare. Oftentimes it's uh, coming from maybe a non-traditional background that leads into more of an entrepreneurship position. Given your CISO title, uh, obviously you need that kind of security foundation. I mean, walk me back to the start of that. What was it that really hooked you on cybersecurity? What was that first position like? Well, I mean, I'm a computer engineer by schooling and my first role out of school was as a security analyst for a very large multinational company. And at the time, you know, I joked and said, you know, I was doing security before it was cool. I mean, I didn't even know what the role was. I thought I was going to be installing antivirus software on, on computers. And I was happy at that because I thought it was cool and I was into all that stuff. You know, it opened up this world to me of, of really what information security is all about, both from the theoretical and then from the tactical. Um, and so I really made my way up through the incident response sort of path, uh, information security. I was an incident responder. I was a team lead. I ran teams that did that. I managed security operations teams. So I kind of worked my way up through that and learned how to build security programs from an operational perspective and then from a strategic perspective. But I also took some time out uh, along the way to go into the business side of things. I've been a product manager before, now doing security solutions. Um, I did some M&A as well. So I worked on a very, very large M&A project and got to learn a lot about the business side and the risk side just outside of my domain. Um, and then I've come back into senior leadership roles, such as CISO roles and, and ran IT teams as well. So it's kind of given me that, that overall perspective from the hands-on technical to right up to the business enterprise risk level. And I feel that that the combination of those pieces really helps me to be able to have those strong technical conversations when needed, but also to be able to walk into a boardroom and not use jargon, not use language, but convey uh, information security risk at a level that a, at a mature board understands. Which is extra important too in the specific role that you have serving both as the chief security expert within Sonrai and then obviously externally facing as well. And, and we'll yeah. come back to that split in a couple of minutes. One of the things that you mentioned, and I actually don't think I've had this, this conversation before. Do you feel there's a specific department within cybersecurity that lends itself better towards security leadership? And I'll provide a little bit more context on my thoughts here. When you mentioned incident response and security operations, that seems like the area within a cybersecurity team where you can get experience leading a large group very early on. And it gives you exposure to a lot of leadership within the broader organization in terms of reporting upwards, in terms of how an incident's progressing, um, impact to the business and um, breaking down that, that combination of business and technical knowledge like you just mentioned. So do you have any strong feelings in terms of what the best place is and, and whether that is the incident response domain? I mean, there's all sorts of security leaders, you know, um, again, my passion was in the incident response. And I think that, you know, if anybody's looking to start to getting into those roles, um, you're very hands-on, you have to understand the environment that you're working in. So when it came to learning a data center and all about networking and software and servers and all those other things, you had to know that because you had to know where the attacks could come from, how they were happening, how to stop them. You, you had to be very involved. And that's just the way that I, I like to learn. So, you know, and I think it's a very, um, everybody needs those these days. It's a very position that everybody needs. And, and I think that there's uh, ways from all different avenues to get into that. You don't have to be a computer engineer to get into that at all. Um, but you're right. I think it does give you the, the visibility across the org. It helps you to understand what happens when we get things wrong. You get to see the scope and then you get to, you know, work on the solutions. You know, you don't just incident respond and then you just kind of hang your hat and go away. Then you're involved in some root cause analysis, how that happened, reporting up to executives. So for me personally, it got my hands in a lot of different pies very early on and helped me learn a lot of really great skills. And, you know, as I joke, you may not see them, but there's also a lot of scars but that's all part of the learning process. So that's my advice. If you really want to get into it, that's a great place to start. Hmm. 
And to your point, right, there's certainly no definitive answer. Hey, this is the way to become a CISO. But I think to everything you just said, and and just some parallels I've heard in, in conversations over the years, it does seem like there's this great opportunity to have that that early leadership experience, which are then able to translate into a whole host of different cybersecurity leadership positions, and obviously keep progressing your career in that manner. Yeah. So maybe there'll be there'll be more research on this at some point, or maybe there's something already out there, um, and it just needs to be to be dug up. So yeah. let's go back to your your specific role now, right? Because we've alluded to this a little bit. Your role is not necessarily the typical CISO role. You have responsibilities internally in securing Sonra, but you also have responsibilities of being a liaison to customers, making sure that you're sharing some of that thought leadership, that research that Sonra is doing internally and being a, a participant in the broader ecosystem, something that has grown more and more important to my understanding with CISOs over the years is, is that feeling of collaboration with one another and that yeah. camaraderie that exists. So talk me through a little bit, just what it feels like to be in your position and what sort of responsibility you feel based on that role. I mean, I really, really love the role that I play here at Sunry. You know, I spent many, many years internally facing, building teams, growing teams, running programs, you know, helping organizations to, to grow. And, you know, one of my mentors early, early, early on in my career said, remember to send the elevator back down. And that always stuck with me. And I was young at the time, right? I was probably about 15, 20 years ago uh, when he said that to me. And, and I always have a passion for giving back, for helping, for collaborating. And so other than just helping Sunry and as an organization do what they need to do from an information security perspective, I work with a lot of CISOs in the industry and security leaders. And, you know, I was, I guess, fortunate to, be, to get into to cloud security uh, you know, six, seven years ago. So I've been doing this for a while. And again, we talk about scars. I've, <laughs> I've got those and I've made my mistakes as well, but like helping these leaders who are just new to it or are finding themselves in these spots where, oh my goodness, we've got this cloud thing and, and, I, and I don't know what to do. And I find that, you know, it's great to be able to go in and help these leaders from, from that perspective and work directly with them and say, you know, I, yeah, I've been here. I literally have been here. I'm not a salesperson telling you, what it looks like to maybe sort of be here. I have been in your position. I know what it feels like. I know what the, you know, the tough decisions are. I enjoy that. And then more broadly, you know, as sort of an evangelist for, for cloud security and, and talking about it, educated, right? I think of all the really gifted and awesome people that I've worked with this in, in this industry. And if you go back to the data center days, they progressed their career very linearly, linearly in a, in a way up through that, that, um, that environment, that sort of era and became experts in their field. The cloud is not like that. And it's not because of the cloud, the cloud just kind of got plopped on everybody out of nowhere. And what did everybody do? Hey, I did this as well. I took my most senior sysadmin data center term and said, hey, you're now my senior cloud admin. And I, and, and I just did that. And you know, luckily he's one of the most brilliant individuals I've ever had the pleasure of working with. And he made the transition, but Again, a lot of organizations have just put this thing on their security teams and they haven't had the chance to learn because, oh, by the way, they're still dealing with the stuff over there. So any opportunity that I can have to help educate the community, my peers, no matter if you're at a competitor or uh, at a peer organization or at a customer or wherever you are, helping them understand and get them up to speed, because as a community, we're all in this together, um, regardless of, of you know, where we're sitting in a chair in that given day. Yeah, the idea of moving over your your data, your systems engineer, I forget the exact title you used. I mean, that is sysadmin, yeah. I mean, that's such a, a common problem, right? And even if it's not like the sysadmin, it's, hey, one of your security engineers is now your cloud security expert. Yeah. I've just seen yeah. that time and time again in, in all these different organizations. And oftentimes it does end up working out. I mean, it turns out if you pull someone who's very intelligent and passionate about security, then they can go ahead and learn a new topic. But the challenge really starts when you've run out of those individuals. Yeah. And then what are you going to fill that cloud security team with if you can't go and hire in the market? Um, a, yeah. Another piece I wanted to, to touch on there before we moved on, just because it came to mind, is this whole idea of sending the elevator back down. Yep. I mean, it's a funny analogy just because it's not actually a thing 
in reality, right? Like I, there's not a single time, maybe I'm missing something. There's not a single time I've gotten to the floor that I'm going to and then pressed lobby to send the elevator back down afterwards. And again, maybe this is a practice that I'm missing, um, <laughs> but the the whole concept from a career standpoint, I think is is obviously spot on. So the the little quirks aside, let's talk about your actual responsibilities day to day, right? And one of the pieces you just harped on is this education responsibility that comes along with um, just, again, being a part of the ecosystem and having this cloud security expertise from your role with your company and, and just the experience actually being responsible for cloud security and organizations. I mean, again, education is kind of I would say table stakes for, for being a CISO in a sense, like this is a collaborative environment, like we've talked about. So what is it that you're doing? I mean, you and Sunray as an organization to go above and beyond in terms of what that looks like with the, the broader ecosystem. Well, I think first and foremost, it comes back to education. You know, um, we spend a lot of time uh, here at Sunray. Uh, we have a research division. Um, and we spend a lot of time learning about the different clouds themselves, right? Like really digging in to understand how things work and then spending the time to pick it apart and say, okay, you know, your traditional definition of what a hacker really is, someone that picks something apart to see how it works, not some kid in a hoodie on his, you know, the movies have glorified it, but really picking it apart and understanding it to the base level. And then figuring out where the holes are, where the gaps are, what are the things that, that we need to look for? And, you know, the cloud is changing very, very rapidly. I mean, I, I forget the statistic, but every day there's like new permissions added to every single cloud every single day. So it's, it's really staying on top of that and, you know, foremost, our engineering teams and our research teams being experts. And then our security research team, um, who that individual I talked about leads our security, uh, security research team here at, at Sunry you know, figuring out, okay, how do we find these things? What are the things that, that people don't know about? And this is all education, right? Helping others understand, doing that dirty work, getting our hands dirty, breaking stuff, trying to fix it, trying to plug the holes and really raising the bar for the whole industry and then offering a way to, to help organizations that may not have the time, the resources or, or the desire to do that, to say, we've done this hard work for you but here you go, you know, we will show you the risks in your cloud and we will help you help you understand them. Um, and we don't hide information. We put a lot of all of this stuff, you know, in, in the way that we do the stuff that we do so people can learn at the same time, not just being, you've got this problem, go do this. Here's the problem, here's what it is, here's how you fix it. And, and you know, I, I think it's, again, I come back to the talking about wearing two hats. It's just awesome to be able to do that. Um, because, you know, coming up in a mature security industry like a data center security um, or the traditional security areas, you don't really get the chance to do that because a lot of those things have been have been solved already or at least well known about. Right. So let's talk about how this actually influences like, the structure of the security department within Sonar, right? Because most of the bigger enterprises that exist today have some sort of threat research team. They're scouring threat intelligence. They're sending out uh, teams to do threat reconnaissance and threat research and, and trying to understand that landscape more clearly. But obviously your organization has an even bigger responsibility in doing that. These are supposed to be building the products that are actually protecting against these threats as well. Uh, so how does that actually change the dynamics within your security team compared to just a standard security organization and their standard research operations? I think that what I, you know, what we find here is that, you know, that research team is very, very tightly coupled with our engineering team. You know, um, a lot of times in larger organizations, you have your your threat hunters and and those folks, researchers, sort of off in an area doing what they're doing, and and they'll come back and they'll work with say their blue teams. Um, you know, maybe they'll work with the engineering teams, but this is a very tight coupling. Um, because as we're learning and finding these things, it's going right over to the engineering team to say like, listen, this is what we found, you know, this is how it happens. This is how you would do it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, the engineering team is building the, the solutions to find, and then, you know, report on those problems. At the same time, we have a very tight coupling with, with our marketing team. I mean, you know, very, very tightly coupled because it comes back to getting that message out to the community as well. So, 
And it's like a continuum. You've got this, you know, we can do some research where we produce a very detailed, very technical research paper, but there's a continuum of ways that you, you put information out. And that might be to your hardcore security person. That's great. But you also need to get the message out to various layers of, of organizations. You know, you want to get out to the manager of the team so that they understand it, but you're not going to give them a six, seven, 15 page research paper. You're going to want to give them something that's more understandable. And then all the way up to like, say the CISO level where, you know, they need to know the information. They need to know the executive summary. They need to understand the risk and the risk that it poses to their business, or at least to be able to make that decision. So we're very tightly coupled with that team as well to help us, you know, distill the information up or down into, into ways that is consumable by the different, uh, the different groups. And it's, it's fun. It's also really, really challenging. I've written research papers that are very detailed and the marketing team comes along and says, well, okay, we got to get this to a CISO. Can you drill this up to an executive summary in, in, you know, a paragraph? And you're like, oh, okay, yeah. You know, and it makes me step back, back into my CISO role and say, well, what is, what is this meaningful to me when I've rolled up my sleeves and gone all the way down the rabbit hole? So I find that again, tightly coupled with marketing, tightly coupled with engineering and then tightly coupled with sales. I mean, you know, and then that's a whole other set of messaging and, and, and ways to talk about this. Yeah, Rob Smith and Brad Laporte, who are ex-Gartner analysts, came on the show a few episodes back. And one of the pieces that we discussed was the detailed report that exists behind the Gartner Magic Quadrant, which I'd never heard of. And after pulling some folks on, on LinkedIn after the fact, they certainly had not heard of either. Um, and so to your point, there's this desire for distilled information and a lot of great work that's being lost behind the scenes and, and certainly relatable with anyone who's who's reported up to a board. And so you're, you're talking about this coupling between different divisions, right? Marketing, sales, I mean, these teams obviously have a reliance on your security organization in order to do their jobs effectively. So it kind of changes the dynamic of security's role within an organization, right? Mm -hmm. From kind of a cost center to a value generator. So how does that influence like some of the inner workings of your security team that a lot of CISOs constantly deal with, like asking for more budget, for example? Is that something where you've seen, hey, I still have to make obviously logical, rational requests and I have to back up those requests with like, again, just clear reasoning and a business case. But is it something where you feel it's a lot more lenient and generally you kind of get what you're looking for because it is so important to the organization? Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, it all comes as a CISO, you're always having to put your business hat on first and make business decisions. So like you said, reasonable, rational requests backed up by a, a, a business reason to say, this is why we need what we have. Does it help that, that I work for a security vendor and that everybody in the organization is very, very knowledgeable about the risks and the why? Absolutely. What I find is there's a lot less of that, you know, barrier to entry, barrier to get in the door, barrier to have that conversation about why we might need to do something, why we might need to purchase something, why we might need to, to, to build or grow a team. Um, but at the end of the day, we're all executives making decisions. On the flip side, being a product company, we're not a multi-billion dollar, you know, multinational organization that has a $200 million security budget either. You know, we have to make decisions that are, um, you know, based on where we are, based on, on our funding, based on our market, based on everything. So, you know, in one hand, the, the bar is lowered, but in other hand, you're going to have these other sort of, um, I don't want to say struggles or challenges. You're just going to have these other set of variables that you have to work through. So it's just a, it's a juggling game. It's just, you, you're juggling different things sometimes. Right. And to your point, getting a, a seat at the table, right, which is such a common expression in security, it's a lot easier when everyone at the table already understands the value of the topic that you're coming to represent. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, on that piece, right, there's kind of this longstanding debate in cybersecurity of who the CISO should report to. And to my knowledge, that hasn't been settled once and for all yet. And I don't think this will settle it either. But I'm curious, for you, who is it that you actually report to in the organization? And what do you think the influence is there? So I report to our co-founder, uh, Sandy Bird, who I, who's our CTO as well. Um, you know, I think who, who the CISO reports to is really dependent on the company and the size of the organization. 
I've reported into IT leaders, I've reported into uh, a CFO, I've reported now into a CTO, uh, twice actually. Um, and it really depends on the makeup of the org and, and, and what they are. So in very technical organizations, I've found that I've reported into a CTO type role. Um, they understand it, they get it, they've got a, a firm seat at the table, they can communicate the message well. Um, at the end of the day though, you know, where do I see this going? I, I see that you know, the CISO role evolving to being the seat at the big table, reporting into someone like a CEO. Um, you know, there's, our, there's a lot of talk and, and it's a, an interest of mine about CISOs being on boards as well. And it's something that I'm very interested and very passionate about. And I think is that you know, data is the most expensive commodity in the world and all organizations run on data. Um, and protecting their data and making sure it's held in confidentiality, it's got integrity, it's, you know, it's available when it's needed, uh, is now a big risk to organizations. So I think that you'll see as the, as the role matures and as, as just sort of the understanding of the role matures, I think you're going to start seeing more CISOs reporting up to roles like the CEO. And hopefully you're going to start seeing more CISOs being uh, sitting on the board or at least people with strong cybersecurity experience sitting on the board asking uh, the right questions of the organization like they would ask the CFO for, from a financial risk, like they would ask the legal officer from a legal regulatory risk, like they would ask the head of marketing from a product and competitive risk, you know, but asking really good um, questions that come from years of experience in the field. Yep, totally makes sense. sense. Totally. I think like the space as a whole has become more of a priority for boards. And so naturally the transition for that would be, okay, now let's get people in here sitting on these boards who actually deeply understand this as opposed to continuing to rely on the kind of like average uh, familiarity that comes along yep. with being on a board and then some of that executive experience over time. Uh, so makes sense as a, as a natural transition. I want to get to cloud security and, and some thoughts that, that you have there. But last question before we do that, CISO's jobs are very classically in jeopardy. And I'm curious your honest thoughts. Do you think your job is safer or less secure because you work at a security product company? So like in the case of a breach, for example. I mean we come back to the topic of, of the executive team and the leadership understanding the space that we play in. Um, yeah. You know, I would say that we all understand that, you know, we're trying to plug every single hole we can, every single hole we don't know about as fast as we can. Um, and it only takes an attacker to find one thing to cause some real damage. So I think from, from that perspective, you know, the organization I work for is, is very aware of what this is about. Um, so as I feel as long as I'm making the right decisions, uh, identifying the risks, communicating the risks at the level at which the executive understands, I think that, you know, my job is just as secure as anybody else. That said, I will go back to that same comment. I think that the role of the CISO, you know, is evolving into this C-level, business-level sort of true executive role. And if CISOs can learn to communicate the risks at that level and be clear about those risks, then I think that that greatly helps them in their job. Um, but at the end of the day, it comes back to the organization that you work for and, and where they value you. And if you're a checkbox, then it's easy to erase the check and find a new checkbox. So there's also that decision that a CISO has to make is you know, what am I going into? What is the, what is the role? What is the, the, the value of the role I'm going into? So. Right. Obviously very dependent on the culture of the organization, like you're pointing to, yeah. right. And it's kind of balancing these two elements, which we've talked about a little bit here, which is, I mean, Hey, everyone at the, in the organization understands the dynamics in cybersecurity and kind of this idea of breaches are somewhat inevitable, but we're going to do uh, the absolute best we can and, and plug as many holes as we can, like you said, uh, but then obviously balanced with the, the PR impact being much more severe if you're a cybersecurity product company, as opposed to just a general product company, because you're the ones who are supposed to be solving this and you have to make sure that you're practicing yep. what you preach, right? Yeah, um, and so I say to mo most organizations too, you know, it used to be, if we, if we had an incident, then it became when we had an incident. And then now it's about the bl it's blast radius context, right? 
what is right. the context of this thing? And your job as a as a senior risk person is to minimize the risk. You know, a CFO is never going to minimize all the risks financially, but what they're or sorry, is never going to eliminate all the risks financially. But what they're going to do is they're going to minimize them to an acceptable state. Same thing with us. Right. Okay. And and let's transition over to that that cloud security piece again. This is obviously where you spend a great deal of your time. And there's a lot that's talked about in cloud security. So I want to make sure we get at something that's hopefully insightful for our listeners here. I know we talked about risk contextualization a bit before we started recording here. This is something that we've talked about on Secure Ventures recently. We had uh, several guests come on actually talking about this, uh, this concept and uh, just some of the, the new spaces that are developing from a contextualization standpoint, some of the new data sources, uh, Yotam of Syera, for example, and what they're doing with cloud data security. I mean, risk contextualization, again, something a lot of people are trying to tackle. A lot of people see the value of today. Not many companies are doing it or doing it well. What do you think is a specific area of risk contextualization that companies are getting wrong? So companies trying to adopt these tools and put them into their environment or companies building some of these contextualization tools and maybe slightly missing the mark in terms of what the customer is actually looking for? Well, I think, you know, one of the areas that I see, um, you know, organizations getting off track, and I don't want to say wrong, but getting off track is trying to bring their processes and methodologies from the old world into the new world and trying to repeat them in the cloud. Um, you know, there's a bunch of paradigms that have shifted, you know, the network no longer forms the boundary of the clouds, so you can't just form a network, stick some gear at the boundaries and monitor that and, and be good. You know, there's a lot of other ways by which, you know, data uh, and attackers can move across your environment that, that are not reliant on the network, they happen at the cloud level. So I think that that's one of the areas, it's not understanding where how the paradigms have shifted and trying to use old methodologies to do that. I think the other thing is that, you know, playing whack-a-mole, or as we say, chasing ghosts, um, the speed and scale of the cloud is, is the biggest success of the cloud, right? That's why organizations are flocking to the cloud in droves. That's why these cloud companies are making so much money, because organizations can move a lot quicker at scale that has been unheard of before. But yet security teams are trying to whack moles and chase ghosts. And you have to start thinking about how do I operate security at the speed and the scale of the cloud, which dovetails into the next thing. And I literally <laughs> gave a webinar this morning on this, on this topic and we got into it in the breakout session, automation, right? Another big, huge benefit of automation uh, has brought to organizations is that's why they can move at the speed of the scale. DevOps teams aren't having people manually deploy stuff. They're running infrastructure as code. They're running scripts. They're doing everything automation. But then you talk about automation to the security team and they go, Ooh, I don't, I don't know about that, you know, but yet that's what your dev teams are doing and your DevOps teams are doing. And they're probably making problems at speed and scale because of that automation. And so I see a lot of organizations that are very hesitant. And listen, I get it. Nobody wants to be the person that deployed the automation that took down the application for a day. That's not fun. But at some point, I think we have to realize all the teams that are, that are doing this are already doing it. And the problems that are getting created at that speed and at that scale are getting created because of that. So we need to leverage it as the solution. And I think we need to lean into it. And listen, it's like everything else. It's, if we do it properly and, and we've got the right investments and the right education and how to do it properly, we've put the time into to working with the business as not an ivory tower, but as a group of consultants, that we can do this just as well. We can be that sec DevOps team. And I'm not one for, you know, for buzzwords, but we can be that team to do that. So yeah, your developers and your DevOps teams are, are building at scale and creating at scale using automation. We're, we're securing the environment, we're minimizing the risks at scale. And that's where I see a lot of companies um, struggling. And then last but not least is that contextualization. You know, this team's doing this, this team's doing this, this team's doing this, this team's doing this. And because of sort of the way the cloud has organized it, but you're not really seeing the risk within context. And if you're not seeing the risk within context, you're probably missing your most critical risks and you're running on this, oh, we're fine mentality where you're not really fine, you're just actually, you're not stepping back to see the forest for the trees. 
Well, let's talk about the automation piece a little bit more because I think, again, a lot of people would agree with you that automation is extremely important both in security organizations across an entire enterprise and is in many ways the future of enterprise as a whole. It's just finding different areas that you can optimize, which frees up your people to perform more strategic thinking and, and more valuable tasks. So if everyone knows how knows that it's important, the important piece is where are you going to actually apply it and how? I'm curious, do you have a specific example of a way that you've applied automation within your security team within the last year and the value that you got out of it? Let's say the most important, most valuable process that you've automated in the last year. Well, I think one of the things is, is preventative measures. First and foremost, setting the guardrails. The clouds actually give you, you know, the three major clouds give you a lot of great tooling for setting guardrails. You know, a great example that I talk about is like service control policies, SCP and AWS. You know, you apply them at the organizational level and the account level to deny things from happening. So if I know that I don't want an S3 bucket ever made public, well, don't wait till it happens to then have to react to it. Put, put something in place to say that this deny it from ever happening. So, you know, automating your guardrails, your, your, your basic security is one area that I think, you know, any organization could go into. It's not without risk, but it's relatively low risk compared to some of the other, other automations you might want to get into. Um, and that greatly helps. And why it also helps is because it takes people out of that equation. So now someone doesn't have to go do something. You know, we're all struggling for resources. We're all struggling for the right resources. So it frees up those resources to do higher level, more important things than clickety clackety on a keyboard, you know? And, and I think that from the risk reduction perspective, but also from an overall organizational perspective, you know, implementing your guardrails as, as prevention, as prevention automation is, is it's been a big step forward for us. It's an interesting point because I don't typically think of preventive measures as automation, but in a way, if you kind of expand your traditional thinking around what automation really is, it's streamlining a manual process. So if previously you had to manually check for these different configurations and then revert them, then setting a preventative measure is essentially automating that process because it's just um, disabling that ability to begin with. Uh, yeah. I am having a tough time coming to grips with the idea that like every single firewall rule that you have in your organization is then automation as well. By that same logic, uh, some organizations might be might be taking credit for groundbreaking automation uh, in their security team that that they don't uh, that yeah. misleads their their activities a little bit. But it is a, an interesting concept. It's a risk decision, right? Automation in general is a risk based decision. Right. You think about it's always the, ooh, we don't know what's going to break. Oh, you can't do that because you might break something. And and the way I talk about it, you know, at a very base level, very basic level, is to say, well, what would you rather have? Would you rather have something that was thought out, designed, reviewed, planned, and implemented? and have it break and everybody waiting around being like, okay, is this, you know, that, that proverbial, and I've been there where you actually push the button to do the thing. And you're like, you know, is this going to sink us all and have it and, and have it break, but have everybody there ready and waiting for it to happen um, and fix it. Would you rather go through that motion or would you rather find out the next day that someone just posted a whole bunch of your data somewhere on the internet, you know, one of them you can deal with, one of them you know what happened, one of them you can explain. Yeah, you might take out your application for a few hours and it might cost you a lot of money. You've got a great story to tell on why that happened. We were trying to do better security. We thought we had it done. Oh my goodness, something screwed up. We're sorry, but you know, that's a that's a good story to tell. When you wake up and find that your data has been posted somewhere, those are stories you don't want to be telling. Like those are things that are very, very hard to, to walk back from. So again, it comes to that risk-based decision. And I think that taking it away from the technology speak and putting it in that perspective is, is also, um, we get back to your thing about how I see people kind of where they need some help is security leaders need to stop talking about technology so much and start talking about risk and business value. And they need to start making those, those leaps. 
because if they don't, then then their conversation's lost, and and rightfully so. You know, your CFO, your CEO, your chief legal, they don't have the time to learn all the intricacies. They're expecting you to know all of that, or at least be able to distill it up and then present it in a way that that, that they're used to hearing it. So, agreed. Okay, wrapping up here. Last question for you: Are you currently hiring any specific types of folks that should reach out to you if they're listening? I mean, I, I mean, this is standard. I listen to everybody. You know, we're always looking for good for good engineers. Uh, you know, personally, I think when we talk about the research team, we're always looking for good cloud security researchers. Um, and listen, you don't have to have an arm's length of experience. I, when I do interviews, I always look for people that are just keen to learn. Um, you know, sometimes I find people with the longest resumes, you, you interview them and it's just like, okay, you've got a lot of knowledge, but I want someone that's going to come in and be excited and dig in. I want someone in an interview that's going to say, you know what, I don't know that, but here's how I would go solve that problem. So, you know, cloud security researchers, and, and that's the type of people that, that, that I'm looking for. And I think that in general is the type of people we look for here at Sunway. Yep. Totally makes sense. Especially again, like we talked about a space that's so rapidly developing, even if you do have a laundry list of experiences, I mean, the experiences might not even be relevant two or three years from now. Um, and so you need someone who's going to be willing to evolve with those trends. And then the last piece that that I'll mention, just since you mentioned it earlier, is I guess, if you're looking for a, a CISO to give you some advice via your board, then uh, then Eric's your guy, go ahead and and reach out. And it sounds like he's willing to, to chat about it further. So I certainly uh, am. Perfect. All right, Eric, thanks again for your time. Can't appreciate, can't thank you enough. Just sharing this perspective again, such a unique role within our industry um, and appreciate all the insight you shared. Awesome. Thanks, Kyle. Have a great day.